Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining our EPA prep class brought to you by Johnstone Supply. So I'm going to pick up where we left off yesterday, and um, we got just a few more things to cover in the Montreal Protocol. So when we left off, we were talking about um, refrigerant cylinders and recovering all the remaining refrigerant out of a cylinder so that we can render that tank useless. So, you know, when we go out and we buy a brand new 30 pound pan, uh, jug of refrigerant and we use all the refrigerant out of that jug, you know, we can't just dispose of that cylinder. We can't just, um, you know, uh, pop the, the top of the cylinder and put it in the back of our van until we get back to the shop and then it'd be empty. We actually have to hook that up to our recovery units and pull the rest of the vapor off that tank so that we can render that tank completely useless. And then we can discard and recycle the metal off from that. Now, before opening or disposing of any appliance containing a, you know, a chlorofluorocarbon, any kind of a CFC and HCFC, uh, any refrigerant that is, you know, uh, chlorine and fluorine based, uh, you know, we recover refrigerant and we put it in a, um, uh, you know, we recover it down to a proper level and then we put it into a recovery cylinder. So section 608 um, under, with the safe disposal requirements, it is the final person in the disposal chain that is responsible for ensuring that any CFC, HCFC or HFC refrigerant has been removed from household refrigerators or other appliances. That's one of the things that I did quite often is um, uh, a few of the local municipalities that uh, I worked in, they would, um, you know, they would grab all of their refrigerators and freezers that they would do on heavy trash pickup in the area. And then they would line all of those up. And then once a year, I would go in and I would go through every single one of those units, sometimes hundreds of units and make sure. I mean, it was a lot. Uh, I would just I'd set up every recovery unit that we had available and just set up a chain. And we just went from unit, unit to unit. And so when we did that, you know, we recovered the refrigerant out of it into a recovery tank, made sure that we hit proper uh, evacuation levels, and then we labeled that unit for disposal. Well, you know, depending on um, your local jurisdiction, it may not happen that way. So if a piece of equipment ends up at a recycle center, it becomes the responsibility of that recycle center to make sure that it is meeting proper recovery rates. So uh, that just went into effect a few years ago. So they're required to have somebody on site now to verify that the refrigerant has been removed from those. You know, I can remember, you know, 20, 30 years ago, you go over to a, uh, a scrapyard and you could still hear refrigerators, you know, sitting in the scrapyard. <laughs> it was just, it was common. So that, that had to be changed. You know, another thing that we had um, made adaptations to just a few years ago was this portion of it. So uh, to knowingly release a CFC, HCFC, HFC, or an HFO refrigerant during the service, maintenance, repair, vandalism, theft, or disposal of appliance is illegal. You know, if you remember when copper prices were crazy, we started having a lot of vandalism and a lot of theft of our condenser coils. So we, uh, we added this part to the Clean Air Act to be able to prosecute against people who were uh, vandalizing and and stealing coils because all they would do is they would go up to them, cut the tubing, let the refrigerant release, and then steal the copper. Not really understanding what they were doing to the environment. So we actually added some new requirements and some new um, prosecuting opportunities because of that. So refrigerants emitted when cutting a line without properly evacuating the appliance violates the venting prohibition. So it has became a portion of our law. So, you know, vending refrigerant from a recovery machine or recovery cylinder after use is also illegal. You know, we have to recover everything, all of the vapor in our entire system. Uh, records of recovered refrigerant must be kept to ensure venting does not take place after recovery from an appliance. So, you know, we have you know, documents that we can use that can be, um, you know, that can be registered for that piece of equipment as how much refrigerant when we took it out. We're going to see a lot more of that moving forward. It's not been, uh, you know, a huge part of our industry in the uh, in the residential side, but we're seeing new legislation that is actually going to uh, adjust that. So small quantities of isobutane used in household freezers can be vented. So, you know, we're starting to see R290 and R600 as refrigerants, you know, that are being used in just a few ounces. And, you know, currently we don't have equipment that is designed to recover our A3 refrigerants. We're starting to see manufacturers produce those, but most of the equipment that we have, you know, that we currently have in our vans is not rated for A3 refrigerants. So, you know, that is going to be a uh, an exempt refrigerant. 
So releasing mixtures of nitrogen and refrigerant that result from adding nitrogen to a fully charged appliance to leak check is considered a, a violation of the prohibition on venting. So only a few ounces of refrigerant mixed with nitrogen is considered a leak trace gas and may be released without recovery. Uh, that's one of them that um, I always question because it's not specific. Uh, I'm a numbers guy. I like to have an exact number. Um, what they are saying is only a few ounces, which means very minimal amount of refrigerant, but it's not completely specified. So uh, that number is a, a little bit skewed. Wish there was a, a more accurate number for that. You know, the only way to get to that would be to pull everything out and then put it a few ounces in it and nitrogen. Sure. nitrogen. That's right. So yeah. we, what they're saying is don't um, don't assume that there's just a few ounces in the system. If you walk up to a system and, it, and it's got 10 PSI of pressure on it, don't assume that there's only a few ounces in there and that you can use nitrogen to pop that up to, you know, two or 300 PSI to do some leak checking. Uh, it has to be recovered in case it's in liquid form because you might have more than just a few ounces of refrigerant in there in liquid form. Okay, so we have three processes we need to understand because they're they're similar, but they're very different. And um, the, I'm sure there will be some questioning on this, and there's a lot of people who don't understand what it actually is. So when we talk about the three R's, we're gonna talk about recover. So when we recover refrigerant, that means that we're gonna remove refrigerant in any condition from a system, and we're gonna store it in an approved recovery cylinder or a container and recovered refrigerant may be charged into the same system, another system with the same owner, or shipped to an approved reclaim facility. So that's typically what we do in our industry. You know, we recover refrigerant and we put it in a cylinder. Uh, and that's typically, as a contractor, that's typically the only step that you see. But we also do other things, because a lot of guys don't understand what happens to that refrigerant once it comes to a wholesaler. Well, what happens after we recover refrigerant, we can do one of two things. One of them is a recycle, which means to extract the refrigerant from an appliance, which is what we're doing, and then clean that refrigerant for reuse in equipment of the same owner without meeting all the requirements for reclamation. So what a recycle does is we take that refrigerant out, but it is processed. It's not chemically separated. It's basically just filtered. And so at one of my previous experiences in life, that's one of the things that we would do. So when we were doing a, a rooftop replacement on a grocery store, you know, we might bring 30, um, you know, 10 to 20 ton rooftop air conditioners off from a roof, right? Because some of those are pretty significant, uh, you know, grocery stores, some of the larger ones had a lot of air conditioning equipment. So when we were doing upgrades of RTUs, we would bring every unit off from the roof and we'd bring it down, you know, and set it on the uh, on the parking lot. And our headquarters was in Michigan and we would um, we, we actually had a recycling facility in Michigan. And it was a great big machine that had basically a bunch of filter dryers on it. So that's what we were doing is we were removing the moisture and we were removing acid to make sure that it was neutralized refrigerant. So we would take all of our RTUs, we would ship down 500 pound recovery cylinders, you know, on skids, and we would set them up. And then we had an independent company come and they would recover all of the R22 out of those rooftop units, put it in these 500 pound cylinders. We'd ship them back to Michigan where we ran it through our recycle facility. So our recycle facility just cleaned up the refrigerant. We owned it. Because remember, if we were talking about that, you can take our you can take refrigerant out of a system and reuse it as long as it is in the same ownership. You can't sell it, you can't use it in somebody else's equipment. But if you own the equipment, you own the refrigerant as well, which means you can put it back in your own equipment. And that's what we did. So we ran it through our recycle facility, we cleaned it up, we put it back in 100 pound cylinders. They were just standard recovery cylinders, 100 pound clean recovery cylinders. And then we could take those 100 pound cylinders and we could ship it out to any of our locations that we needed that refrigerant because it was now clean refrigerant. It wasn't brand new refrigerant. We didn't chemically separate it. All we did was cleaned it up. And so that is labeled recycled refrigerant because it was ran through a proper machine to remove moisture and contaminants and to make sure that it had the proper pH level. So not brand new refrigerant, 
but definitely cleaned up refrigerant. The other thing that we can do is we can actually reclaim that refrigerant. And that's typically what happens when you bring a used cylinder of refrigerant to a wholesaler. That means to process that refrigerant to a level equal to, or like a, a virgin refrigerant product specifications as determined by its chemical analysis. So reclaimed refrigerants must meet AHRI 700 standards before it can be resold. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to take that refrigerant that you recover, we're going to bring it to a facility and we very possibly, very probably will recycle it where we run it through some filters and clean it up, but then we're going to send it into the processing facility and we're going to chemically break it down into its core components. So if it is an HCFC, we're going to break it down into hydrogen, chlorine, fluorine, and carbon. We're going to separate all those chemicals and then we're going to put them all back together and it's essentially going to be a brand new refrigerant, right? It's going to have the same specifications, the same chemical analysis. That's a big deal. It's very inexpensive or very expensive. That means someone had to actually take the time to recover that refrigerant out of a system, put it in a container, take it to a wholesaler. The wholesaler takes it to a recycle facility. Recycle facility sends it over to the reclaim facility. The engineers break it down into its core components and the chemists put it all back together. And then it has to be recertified as a brand new refrigerant and then it can be resold. So when we talk about um, virgin supplies of R22, we can also talk about R22 that has been recovered, recycled, reclaimed, and resold. So it's not brand new refrigerant that was manufactured, it was reclaimed refrigerant. And a lot of people don't understand that, that R22 and some of the other refrigerants that are not being manufactured can still be available in a reclaimed composition, but it's probably going to be very expensive stuff. So that's uh, just something that not everybody understands is how that process works. So refrigerant recovery and recycling equipment manufactured after November 15th of 93, somewhat important, must be certified and labeled by an EPA approved equipment testing organization to meet EPA standards. And you'll see that on your recovery equipment. An EPA approved certification label is required on all new recovery equipment. So if you watch our, um, our flex train class on recovery equipment, you'll see some of the uh, the dinosaurs that I used to work with, um, you know, back before 1993, and those things were not certified to work with our new refrigerants. One of the big differences is on some of those older uh, reclaim units is they, uh, they did not use an oilless compressor. They had an oil bath. They were a standard reciprocating style compressor, which means you had to change the oil in those regularly. So almost all modern recovery equipment are oilless so that we don't get cross-contamination. Now here's where we get into some really unusual stuff, but you need to know what it is. I've never encountered it in the field and I've worked on some very bizarre equipment, but I've not gotten into these, but they are out there. So there are basically two different types of recovery devices and you're going to need to understand how both of those work. One is called a system dependent. And with that system, it captures refrigerant with the assistance of components in the appliance from which the refrigerant is being recovered. So it's a little bit different process, but there are pieces of equipment out there that that can be done. If we take, for example, a, um, an RV refrigerator, you know, most of those RV refrigerators, Dometic is a very popular company that manufactures RV refrigerators. Those are multi-fuel refrigeration systems, right? So they have a compressor that will operate at high voltage and operate the system, but it also has the ability to use a heat source and that heat source is usually the propane that is in the propane tank of that, uh, that RV. And we use propane to heat up a burner. That burner applies heat to a coil and that coil increases its pressure because of the heat and starts moving that refrigeration circuit. So when we're using the propane function on a camper or RV or marine refrigerator, we're not running a compressor. We're actually using a heat source to make that vapor system work. And so that gets more into that system dependent type of system. Now, if we're talking about self-contained, that's what most of us in the HVAC and refrigeration industry understand. So it has its own means to draw the refrigerant out of the appliance on that self-contained system. That's an active system. 
So we got two different styles that we're going to encounter there. Now, looking at those, um, all no matter what type of system we're going to use, we're going to have some things that will affect that, right? So the recovery time will be increased if the appliance is located uh, in a, a low ambient temperature condition, uh, long hoses are used between them. That was one of the things that I did in the field all the time. Um, you know, a lot of times if I was recovering a refrigerant out of a rooftop unit, I had a hundred foot quarter inch hose. And so I would leave all my equipment down at the van or on the ground because after you've been in the field for a number of years and after you've climbed enough ladders, you realize it's not fun hauling all that stuff to the roof. So I leave all my heavy equipment on the ground and I run my hose up to the equipment, but it increases the length, uh, you know, the length of hose and the length of time that it's going to take to recover that stuff. So long, small diameter hoses between the units um, should be avoided as they will cause excessive pressure drops and increase recovery time. And it does. It, it adds a lot of recovery time but it can add some convenience to the system as well. So just have to be prepared that if you're gonna use a long hose, it's gonna take a lot more time to do that. So upon completion of refrigerant liquid transfer between the unit and the system, uh, guard against trapping liquid refrigerant in the service hose between closed service valves. You know, if we get liquid in our hoses, you know, that is uh, compressed vapor and it will hold a lot more volumetric, you know, refrigerant in its liquid form than in its vapor form. All right, so a technician must have a separate refrigerant recovery cylinder for each type of refrigerant recovered and should have a separate cylinder for refrigerants known to be mixed. So I did that as well. So every one of my tanks had a tag on it that uh, had the type of refrigerant and I used my dates. So that anytime we added refrigerant, I would write the date and how much refrigerant we added to that cylinder. If I ended up having a contam highly contaminated system, I also had one specific cylinder that was for heavily contaminated refrigerants. The downfall of doing that, we're not, we should not mix those refrigerants, but if we have like a contaminated refrigerant cylinder that is mixed refrigerants, when you bring that refrigerant back to a wholesaler and it goes back to the reclaim or to the uh, recycle facility, there's going to be a significant charge for that cylinder. When they test that and find that it has multiple refrigerants in it, they may not even recycle that. They may actually incinerate that refrigerant and it has a upcharge for that, so they won't separate those chemicals. So be mindful of that if you put multiple refrigerants in a cylinder, that it is uh, it's not going to be to your advantage. Uh, if servicing systems that use um, R134A, R410A, and R22, uh, three cylinders are required, even though two of them are HFC refrigerants. So uh, just be mindful that we want to keep every refrigerant in its own cylinder. Uh, it's important not to mix those refrigerants in the same container. Um, it may be impossible to reclaim, and there may be an added cost, like I was just saying. I don't want to mix those, but I did have one for highly contaminated stuff. And I mean, it had to be highly acidic before I do that. Uh, technicians can only uh, charge used CFC, HCFC, or HFC refrigerants back into the same appliance or into another one under the same owner. So that's the regulation that we used for you know our um, refrigerant that we took, excuse me, took out of our units and sent back up to be recycled. Um, used refrigerant may no longer meet the AHRI standards for virgin refrigerant, so it cannot change ownership. That's why we can't take refrigerant out of one piece of equipment and put it into somebody else's. Uh, leak detection methods and uh, devices used must be approved by the manufacturer. Uh, the wrong type of electronic leak detector used with a flammable refrigerant can cause an explosion and bodily injury. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's well worth going back to our uh, flex train class that is actually on our YouTube channel talking about leak detectors because most people don't understand the different types of leak detectors that we have. Some of those have a heated tip to them. So the last thing I want to do is introduce a uh, propane into a heated surface, right? So that's what we're talking about there is we have to understand the types of leak detectors. So to determine the general area of a small leak, we use a electronic or an ultrasonic, and we cover those in our class. Uh, to um, They are considered to be the most effective. So to cause the least amount of damage to the environment, newly installed systems should be pressurized with dry nitrogen for leak detection purposes. That's one of the things that we talk about. That ultrasonic leak detector, you don't have to even have refrigerant in the system. It's actually looking for sounds, high frequency sounds. So we can use just plain old dry nitrogen with no refrigerant trace at all and be able to find leaks with it. So it's a good one to study up on if you don't understand the difference in leak detectors. Uh, if an electronic leak detector is to be used, a trace of the refrigerant system can be added to the system. There again, they just say trace. They're not specific on that. And I'm 
I'm kind of iffy on that. I, I like having exact numbers, but we don't have one. All we have is a trace. Um, a leak trace gas is not considered a refrigerant under the EPA refrigerant management regulations, which means if we use a trace of our refrigerant along with our nitrogen, it does not have to be recovered, which is odd to me. Uh, once the general area of the leak is located, the use of soap bubbles will aid in pinpointing, and that's what I use the most. So we always recommend, you know, two forms of verification for leaks. We use some type of an electronic detector, uh, whatever leak detector of your choice, as long as it's appropriate for that refrigerant, and then we will pinpoint that with our soap to find out what it is, unless it's in a vacuum. But uh, we can actually find leaks in a vacuum if we're using a uh, ultrasonic leak detector. It's a whole other class there. So upon completion of a leak repair and before recharging the system, you want to install a new filter dryer every time. You open up a system, it gets a new filter dryer and complete a standing pressure leak check at the maximum system pressure. And that is what the manufacturer is rating. So if we look on our pieces of equipment, we will actually have pressure ratings on those pieces of equipment and make sure you know those because you may have a different pressure rating on your indoor coil than you do on your outdoor coil depending on the manufacturer and the uh, material that is used for that. So you wanna make sure you understand what those pressure ratings are. They will be labeled. So for safety and uh, system design uh, to contain a flammable hydrocarbon like R290s and uh, R600s and HFO refrigerants that has, um, has to have a leak test before evacuating to 500 microns. So uh, and we always do, you know, if we're making a repair, installing a system, we always do a proper leak check before we do a full evacuation. So unlike natural gas, flammable hydrocarbon or HFO refrigerants do not contain odorants to indicate their presence. So odorants do not need to be added to systems containing flammable refrigerants. That's why we're saying if you're using, um, if you're working on an R290 system, you have to use R290. You can't go grab your grill tank and hook your propane up. Even though it is propane, you just can't do it because it has the, you know, the odorants added to that for safety. We cannot use them in our system. All that's going to do is cause you know, restrictions in our filters and metering devices. So the reason for dehydrating a refrigeration system is to remove water and water vapor. And it's important to, to follow the proper dehydration procedures. So if moisture is allowed to remain in a operating system, hydrochloric and hydrofluoric acids, remember on those HCFCs and HFCs, if there's hydrogen in there, and if there's fluorine in there, if there's chlorine in there, and we start bonding those with hydrogen molecules of water, you know, because hydrogen, we've got hydrogen and oxygen, we can separate those hydrogen molecules. So if we have uh, refrigerant in those systems, and we have moisture in that system, we're gonna end up with a byproduct that is typically gonna be hydrochloric or hydrofluoric acid. So we gotta be very, very careful with moisture. That's why when we get into these, you know, newer refrigerants and newer oils, when we look at the combinations of moisture that is um, potentially going to be able to become a new chemical with a refrigerant and moisture that is going to absorb into the oil, the hygroscopic oil, it's very important to meet these um, lower micron requirements. 500, almost every manufacturer requires 500. I have seen 250 microns in installation manuals before. Um, so it, it, we're getting new standards on that. And most people go, oh, my recovery equipment won't, you know, my, my vacuum pump won't quite do that. Um, yes, it will. Most uh, most vacuum pumps uh, will meet 50 microns and most of them will meet lower than that. So it's all about procedures more than anything. And we'll actually discuss a little bit about that. So we never evacuate a system to the ambient air without first following proper recovery procedures because we don't know how much refrigerant is in that system. You know, if there's a trace of refrigerant in there, there's a trace of refrigerant, which means we need to get that out of there. So we don't just vent it. Um, dehydration. The factors affecting the speed and efficiency are the size of the equipment, you know, the larger capacity, it means we have more volumetric space we have to remove. Ambient temperatures is a huge one. The amount of moisture in the system is a huge one. If we have a lot of moisture in there, it's going to take a while to pull that out. So now we're going to have to pull it out of the oil, we're going to have to pull it out of the surfaces. And the size of the vacuum pump and the suction hose. And I typically will say it is more so important the size of the hose than the size of the vacuum pump. You know, the old rule of thumb is a CFM per ton on average for, you know, what size vacuum pump you would need. Guys all come in all the time and buy seven CFM vacuum pumps and they're working on two ton units. And I go, well, it doesn't matter how big the vacuum pump is. If you don't have a hose that'll handle it, um, you're not going to do anything. You're just going to run your vacuum pump. And you know, if we oversize our vacuum pumps, you have that potential of pulling vacuum too fast and freezing. We'll get into that a little bit too. So the vacuum hoses should be equal to or larger than the vacuum pump intake connection. Uh, the brand of a micron gauge does not 
usually affect the speed of evacuation, uh, but the method used to connect it may. And that's good to know because there are a lot of people who do those incorrectly in the field. So the piping connections to the vacuum pump should be as short as possible and as large in diameter as possible. So for accurate readings during your evacuation, the vacuum gauge should be connected as far away from the vacuum pump as possible. I see a lot of guys will put a tree on their vacuum pump and hook their micron gauge right to that. That is the wrong place. That's only reading your vacuum at the pump. It's not reading it at our system. So measuring a final system vacuum should be done with the system isolated and the vacuum pump turned off. That's why we want that micron gauge at the unit and we want to use a long hose. I do a single hose evacuation system and I have, we've actually got a video on how we do that. I use a core removal tool at my unit. I have my micron gauge right there at my core removal tool and then I run a hose from it over to my vacuum pump. Because every time we run through a manifold gauge set, think about all of those O-rings that we are going through, all of those physical connections. Every one of those is a potential leak point. So I discourage people from using a manifold gauge for pulling vacuum. Um, a system that will not hold a vacuum after it has been evacuated probably has leak. So during evacuation, you may wish to heat the refrigeration system to decrease, uh, decrease the dehydration time. A couple of ways of doing that. You know, if you're in a commercial application, you can turn on the defrost heater on the evaporator coil to make sure it's warming up. If it's on an outdoor unit, we can make sure that we have power applied to the crankcase heater. I don't like doing that because then you have the potential of the compressor coming on. Um, you can do heat blankets. We actually kept heat blankets on our van that we could wrap around a compressor and plug in and warm up the oil on a unit. Because if a compressor has been sitting outside, if I have a compressor that goes bad on a heat pump and it's been down for two weeks and it's been cold outside, that refrigerant is going to migrate into the oil outside. So we need to be able to get that oil out of that refrigerant and we need to be able to do that safely. So one of the techniques that we do is tapping on that compressor with a rubber mallet. That will help in releasing that trapped refrigerant that is in that oil. Because think about how lethargic that oil is going to get. If it's zero degrees outside, that oil is going to be thick. It's going to be like molasses. It's not going to be thin anymore. anymore. So, excuse me, so any refrigerant that migrated back to that compressor is going to be trapped inside of that hygroscopic oil. So we'll keep a rubber mallet around. When we're doing recovery on systems that are cold, we use that rubber mallet to beat the bottom of that compressor, to shake that oil up so we can make sure to get that refrigerant out of that oil. Uh, dehydration is complete when the vacuum gauge shows that you have reached and held the required vacuum of 500 microns or less. I actually have a contractor here in Indianapolis that uh, he requires all of his technicians to maintain 250 microns on all of their systems before they open them up. It's required. It's fantastic. I mean, it's, yeah. very, it's very realistic. If a manufacturer requires 500 and you're doing 250, you're doing a better job than what the manufacturer is requiring. His, what he said today, he says, if I get my technicians to do 250 microns on every installation, I guarantee there's no moisture in that system. And I know that it's a good compressor. It's a quality product. So if I do a proper installation, my equipment is going to have a proper longevity. And he's, he's right. He never has compressor failures. And I truly believe it's because he pulls 250 microns on every installation. It's no big deal to pull 250 microns. If you watch our video, we pulled 400 mic we pulled 500 microns on a two-ton system with a two CFM rechargeable vacuum pump and one hose, four minutes. So if you're not pulling 500 microns, you got leaks. That's all. So if the pressure increases, so we pull it down to 500 microns, and then the pressure, we turn a vacuum pump off, and then the uh, uh, it stops for a few minutes and then rises, there's probably moisture in the system. So if it pulls up to 1,000 microns or so and stops, we've still got moisture that we have not boiled out of that system. If it continues to rise above that 1,000 microns or so, then we've got a leak. But if it just rises and then stops, it's not a leak, it's moisture. We still have moisture in our system. So something to be aware of, very, very common. So the EPA is, con uh, is concerned not only with the prevention of refrigerant venting, but with the technician's overall safety. You know, there's a lot of safety hazards that goes in with refrigerant. I've seen some very, very nasty refrigerant burns. Uh, I follow a couple of um, refrigeration technician sites, uh, particularly on Facebook. And man, there was a, a couple of weeks ago, there was a, a young technician that um, was disconnecting his hoses and did not have the Schrader core in the system. And he was trying to maintain the leak and he had first degree burns on his entire hand. Um, it's pretty bad. So we do see that in our industry. So when handling and filling refrigerant cylinders or operating recovery or recycling equipment, you should wear 
safety glasses, protective gloves, and follow all equipment manufacturer safety precautions. You know, just common safety stuff. We overlook a lot of that in our industry and it's well worth doing. When I was a young man in the industry, um, I was not big on wearing face shields when I was running a wire, um, wire wheel and, until I got a sliver of uh, copper in my eye when I was about 22 years old. And um, so people that know me today know that I'm a safety nut. Um, I don't do um, a lot of things without uh, PPE. And it's because I've had accidents in the industry. Um, you know, uh, learning from the hard way is not the fun way. So um, proper PPE will, will get you a long way. So make sure your recovery machine is grounded when in use, very important. You know, we have a lot of RPMs going on. We have a lot of, you know, potential electrons being generated from our armatures. So we wanna make sure that system is properly grounded so that our equipment is not building up electrons and building up um, voltage charges. I uh, always like to have a, uh, a remote um, um, GFI plug for my equipment as well. Not everybody does, but I like to have them for safety. So when pressurizing a system with nitrogen, you should charge through a regulator. We always use a regulator and you want to, in, they say insert a relief valve in the downstream line from the pressure regulator. A lot of many of most manufacturers actually have that built into the regulator these days. So it's not a separate device. It's actually part of it. Uh, relief valves must not be installed in series. If corrosion builds up, um, is found within the body of the relief valve, the valve must then be replaced, you know, because it's a safety component. We want to make sure it works. So they're saying if you're using those relief valves, you cannot put them in series because if we put them in series, it's actually going to be a cumulative pressure. It's going to double, if we have two of them, it's going to double the pressure before it actually pops off. So if we're using one, they can be cooked in parallel, which is kind of hard to do. Um, so just use one pressure relief valve if you're going to use those. Do not put them in tandem. Um, when leak checking a system, never pressurize the system with oxygen or compressed air. We do not do that. We use dry nitrogen for that. So when mixed with some refrigerants or compressor oil, oxygen is, uh, or compressed air can cause an explosion. So we do not use those. We use dry nitrogen if we're doing any charging or leak checking. Uh, never pressurize a system with oxygen or compressed air. To determine the safe pressure for leak testing, check the equipment nameplate. Like I said, it is on there. It will tell you what it is. So if we were looking at a nameplate, hey, they, look at there, they even added a Daikin one for us. So to determine that safe pressure for leak testing, check the equipment data plate for the maximum low side test pressure value. If we look at that, there it is. 391 is that design low side pressure checking on that. High side was actually tested at 604. We're not gonna put 604 into that system though, because our low side of that system was only tested for 391. So we can go up to 391, but that's it. So. That is our maximum operating pressure for that system for testing. Um, never expose refrigerants to open flames or glowing hot metal surfaces because remember, <clears throat> some of those are flammable. Although reclaimers may accept visibly burnt recovery tanks at high temperatures, refrigerants decompose and form acids. You know, we've all smelled phosgene gas before. Um, so do not warm up your cylinders with your torch. Um, hydrochloric acid is formed if the refrigerant contains, or hydrochloric acid is formed if the refrigerant contains chlorine. And you know, we talked about chlorine and hydrogen mixing. If it's a uh, hydrofluoric acid, it's formed if the refrigerant contains fluorine. So if we're talking about a hydrochlorofluoric, a hydrochlorofluorocarbon refrigerant, we have that potential if there's moisture in our system to not only produce hydrochloric acid, but even hydrofluoric acid. Very, very important to get our moisture out of there. So heating a refrigerant cylinder can result in an explosion and cause serious injuries. If oxygen is also present, it is possible to form carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and phosgene gas. You know, um, what they're talking about is if you're, you know, if you're charging a system and it's 10 degrees below zero and your refrigerant is not wanting to pull out of your tank because your compressor is not getting low enough pressure to pull that out of there, um, you know, there are guys out there that will take their torch and heat up their cylinder to get it to move faster. And what we're saying is do not do that. Worst case scenario, go get you a plastic tub and put some hot water in it from the homeowner and then put your tank in it or get an electric heating blanket. If a hydrocarbon, an HC refrigerant is released into space and an ignition source is provided, an explosion can occur if the refrigerant concentration is above the lower flammability limit and below the upper flammability limit. 
with an ignition source. So with any concentration of flammable refrigerant vapor, what, what we're saying is there is a minimum point at which it will ignite, and there is actually a maximum point at which it ignites, where there is more fuel than there is oxygen. So even if we add a heat source, it's not going to ignite because we have an abundance of fuel. And that's what that upper flammability limit is. So we can have more fuel in a space than will allow it to combust, which is a very dangerous place to be, which is why we only allow a certain amount of ounces of these flammable refrigerants in a system. When working with any solvents, chemicals, or refrigerants, uh, safety data sheets should be viewed by the technician for reference, uh, compatibility with other materials. So we always want to look at our MSDS sheets. Uh, comes with all your refrigerant cylinders when they're new. Uh, if not, you can go online and find them. So silicone elastomers, for example, which are used in seals and gaskets, are not compatible which, with HFO refrigerants. So we're going to find that, you know, with all of these refrigerants that we're going into, there are a lot of differences in them. So we have to understand that a refrigerant can be a replacement in a system, but we also have to understand the components in that system. Because if we take out a, um, you know, an HFC refrigerant and we go to an HFO, we've converted oil and we go right with an HFO, we're going to find out that some of those seals um, will not accept it and we'll have major leaks because of that. So um, understanding what uh, components work with each other are going to be very crucial with understanding these new refrigerants. Uh, refrigerant vapors or mist in high concentrations um, should not be inhaled. They may cause heart irregularities or unconsciousness. In most refrigerant accidents where death occurs, oxygen asphyxiation is the major cause. So according to ASHRAE, remember anytime we get into ASHRAE, we're talking about air quality standards. Uh, refrigerant safety classification A1 designations should be the safest. Because remember, if we move into a B classification, it's now going to be a toxic refrigerant. As we move up the chain to the A2Ls and the A2s and the A3s, they're going to be slightly flammable. So other you know, cautions to be concerned with. Um, respiratory asphy asphyxiation would be a horrible way to die in our industry, and it is possible. So a situation to be aware of. Uh, never apply an open flame or live stream to a flammable refrigerant cylinder. Do not cut or weld any refrigerant lines while refrigerant is in the unit. And do not use oxygen to purge lines or to pressurize the machine. So especially with any of these R290s and R600s, we do not unsolder any of those joints. And even like with filter dryers, I tell guys, if you got a filter dryer that's coming out of system, you don't heat that up. We cut those out. So anytime we're going to be working on a system that has moisture in it or a system that has a flammable refrigerant, we do not solder those joints or heat those joints. We actually cut those joints, then properly evacuate the system, flush them with nitrogen, and then we can do our brazing. Uh, HFO 1234YF, um, starting to be a very, very, very popular refrigerant. Uh, classification A2L um, is not um, as a, uh, doesn't, not as an A3 higher uh, you know, it's it's not as flammable, and we talked about that before. So that special class, those A2Ls, um, they don't maintain combustion on their own. If I take an A3 refrigerant, any of the R600s, R290s, you know, I can put a flame on those. I can propagate a flame, so I can take a torch and I can run that vapor into that torch, and it's going to ignite. And I remove my torch, my heat source, and it's going to maintain its its flammability. When I get into these special classifications like these A2Ls they will not maintain their flammability without that direct heat source. So it's a different type of uh, flammability than what we're used to. We're used to it either it maintains its flame or it doesn't. Well, these A2Ls, um, they have the potential to be flammable, but only with that continual direct ignition source. Um, a red color marking, this is very important. A red color marking is required on all process tubes and other pipes through which a flammable refrigerant flows, passes, or where a service connection is probable. A red color marking. That red color marking must extend a minimum of one inch in both directions from any location. So all of these flammable refrigerants, all of these A3 refrigerants, you're going to see a lot of red. You're going to see red sleeves on the refrigerant tubings. You're going to see red paint on the service valves. So it helps you identify that you have a flammable refrigerant. So if you walk up to a system and you um, see a bunch of red indicators, 
shoot straight for your tags, which we always need to look for our tags anyhow to see what refrigerant and how much of it is in that system. But now we know if we walk up to a system and we start seeing red indicators, red sleeves, red markings, make sure to pay close attention to that system because it should be a flammable refrigerant. Um, in the event of a large release of CFC, HCFC, HFC, HFO, HCs, or any other refrigerant in a contained area, a self-contained breathing apparatus is required. And immediately vacate and ventilate the area. You know, especially you refrigeration guys that are working in walk-in coolers and walk-in freezers, that is a bad thing when your most important task is to try to get out of a cooler that just now had a refrigerant leak and you've had your torch in it. I can go on a tangent about that. A bad experience. Um, and alcohol spray should be used to remove ice from sight glasses or viewing glasses. So if you're working on a system that has a sight glass, uh, just be aware that um, we don't want to use any other heat source besides just alcohol because there is a seal underneath of that sight glass. A lot of times it has that uh, rubber neoprene seal on it. So if we heat that up with a torch, you know, we walk up to the system and it's, you know, frosted up, um, don't hit it with a torch. Use a little bit of alcohol. It'll clean that ice right off of there. Uh, a refrigerant recovery cylinder should be free of rust, damage. It should be labeled, secure, and filled to no more than 80% of its capacity by weight. Why is that? Because once it warms up, it's going to expand and we're going to have a significant increase of pressure inside of that tank. So care must be used to prevent overfilling refrigerant storage cylinders. Some of those older storage cylinders actually had a, um, mm -hmm. a sensor in the tank. So if you ever get a refrigerant uh, tank and it has a sensor in it, that's because we used to connect those to our units and it would shut the recovery unit down once our tank level got to 80%. And that way we didn't overpressurize that tank. Because the worst thing you want to do is have a system that fills that tank to its top. And you go, oh boy, I got a full tank and I don't have another one here. Let me put this in the back of my van. Go on to the next job and it's the middle of summer. And all of a sudden we have 800 PSI or 1000 PSI on a cylinder because the refrigerant has nowhere to vaporize, nowhere to boil to. So it's just going to increase the pressure inside of that tank. So we got to be very, 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 very careful with that. So maximum of 80% inside of a cylinder. All right, um, all recovery cylinders need to be identified. It needs to be a gray body with a yellow top. And we also need to understand that that has two different valves on that. And the difference is the liquid side has a dip tube that goes to the bottom of that tank. Um, you should not heat a refrigerant storage or recovery tank with an open flame because refrigerant in the tank may decompose forming a toxic material. Uh, it can result in uh, venting refrigerant to the atmosphere from the pressure safety valve, because they do have a pressure safety valve on those, and can cause serious injury. So once again, do not heat those tanks with a torch. When using uh, vapor or liquid recovery, the fill valve, the fill valve of the recovery cylinder can be controlled by a mechanical float device, an electronic shutoff device, a, uh, or by measuring the gross cylinder weight. I always do it by weight. You know, keep that thing on your scales the entire time you're using it. Uh, the pitch of the recovery device does not control the fill level of the recovery cylinder, and care must be used to prevent overfilling the refrigerant storage cylinders. Do not go above 80%. A reusable container for refrigerant that is under high pressure. So, doesn't matter. Anything above 15 PSI for using it for storage, that thing needs to be hydrostatically tested every five years. So that's a big misunderstanding in our industry. We have recovery cylinders that have been sitting around the shop for 15, 20 years, right? Never been swapped out. They need to be swapped out every five years. So if that thing is overdated, bring it in, take it to the wholesaler, get it sent back and get you a fresh recovery cylinder. You know, a lot of times you know, we'll have a recovery cylinder sitting in a shop and it doesn't get taken in because we don't put much into it. You know, if we've got an oddball refrigerant, so say we've got a, an R414B recovery cylinder in our shop. We may not be recovering hot shot very often. So we need to take a look at those cylinders and make sure they've not been sitting around for more than five years. If they've been sitting around for more than five years, you need to get rid of them. Take them to a wholesaler, get them swapped out. Uh, a disposable refrigerant cylinder may never be used to recover refrigerant. Uh, we actually started installing check valves in those so that we don't put refrigerant back into those. Those are a, a temporary cylinder. Uh, when transporting cylinders containing uh, used refrigerant, 
a DOT, Department of Transportation classification tag, and label must be attached to the cylinder, right? So portable refillable tanks or containers used to ship uh, CFC, HCFCs, or other refrigerant obtained with recovery equipment must meet DOT standards. So we have to use the appropriate cylinders when we're doing this. Big, big thing, especially as we're moving into these flammable refrigerants. DOT does not like flammable refrigerants. Uh, DOT regulations require that the number of cylinders of each gas be recorded on the shipping paper for hazard class 2.2 non-flammable compressed gases, and refrigerant cylinders must be positioned upright when they are shipped. I won't even go into that one because most manufacturers of um, storage racks for vans, those are horizontal. They're not supposed to be. They're supposed to be upright. So next thing, I won't even go into that one. Uh, before shipping any used refrigerant in a cylinder, a refrigerant label to identify the type of refrigerant um, recovered is placed on a recovery cylinder to avoid accidental mixing of recovered refrigerants. Allow the re, uh, recycler to identify the contents and allow the technician's company to determine the amount of refrigerant recovered for the record keeping purposes. We're going to spend a lot of time looking at these new requirements for tracking um, refrigerant recovery. It's a, it's a big deal. Um, a lot of new regulations on that. All right. So this will actually be the end of our section on core. So it was good timing. I love spending time on this chart because this is the chart that will really help you understand why we are making changes in our industry. And then I'll allow a little bit of time for some questions if anybody has. Because I know we've covered a lot of stuff. That's one of the comments that was just made that this is a mouthful. It is a mouthful. It is a lot of talking. When we do this class, we do it in one day. So when we do our monthly EPA classes, we do this class straight. Four and a half, five hours of talking. I typically come home and I'm like, I don't want to talk to anybody for a day. That's a lot of stuff to cover. And there's a lot of things to understand. Just always remember this. We are changing our refrigerants because they were destroying our ozone and increase in global warming. We look at refrigerants from two perspectives. ODP, which is its ozone depleting potential. We look now at global warming potential. When we first started looking at our refrigerants back in the 1990s, we knew we had an issue with ozone depletion. The hole in the ozone layer was what we talked about in the 1990s. So what we did is we looked at the refrigerants that had any ozone depleting potential. So that was refrigerants that had chlorine. Remember, ozone depletion is based on chlorine. So we looked at the refrigerants that we were using and we went, oh snap, all of them have chlorine. R11, R12, R22, R123, R502. That was our primary refrigerants up into the 1990s, early 1990s, right? We look at what their classifications were. We had our pressure ratings on those over here. We had a low, uh, low pressure, so that was a low pressure, you know, chiller style refrigerants. We had medium pressure, which is our 12, so that was our um, low temp. That was our cooler and our ref uh, freezer refrigerant of choice. We had R22 in our air conditioning systems. We had R123 in commercial chillers and uh, blow spray foam applications. And then we had R502, which was a very low temperature commercial, especially in our, um, our low temp chillers, ultra low temp stuff. So they weren't horrible, except for um, R123 was a B1. So none of them were flammable. And the majority of them, we're not toxic except for R123. R123 was slightly toxic, right? So the biggest concern of all of that was right up here. Remember, we we're going to use CO2 as our base, right? CO2 is what we were basing everything off from. So we found that we had a lot of chlorine, a lot of chlorine, a little bit of chlorine, a very little bit of chlorine, and a little bit more chlorine. So we immediately, as a world, took an initiative to get rid of those solely based on chlorine. And we replaced those, right? So we took our R11 and our R12, we came up with some solutions for those. 
Um, the one that we struggled with the most was that R123, but because it had the lowest amount of chlorine, it took longer to get rid of. Otherwise, we replaced our R12 with 134A for medium temperature, and then we replaced R12 with R404 for low temperature. So 134A for our medium temps and our um, automotive air conditioning, because automotive air conditioning used to use R12 as well. And then we used our 404 for all of our freezers and some of our coolers, but primarily freezers. And then we took a um, R410A, so we got rid of R22, and we went with R410A for residential, and we went with R407C in those commercial R22 systems, and we also came up with an R422B. So those were all replacements for that first generation of refrigerants. And we thought that that was going to be our long term because we successfully got all of those down to zero ozone depleting potential. And then we basically covered our entire range of refrigerants that covered our automotive, that covered our HVAC, that covered our refrigeration, and all was fine and dandy. And the ozone hole started fixing itself. And we were like, woohoo, we fixed that problem. By the time we got into the 2000s, what we found was, yeah, the ozone was doing well, but the earth was still warming. And we went, hmm, what happened? Did we miss something? We know that we're still generating pollutants from um, vehicles, you know, from um, petroleum based fuels. We knew that those hydrocarbons were releasing gases, but we were warming at a rate that was higher than those releases. So fossil fuel emissions were not the only culprit. So the scientists went back and they went, okay, let, let's look at some other things. So they looked into fluorine and they found that fluorine was a pretty significant culprit in global warming. And they went, okay, well, let's go back and relook at all of this and let's see how things played out. And here's the thing that happened. All right, so on our low temp stuff, our R12, it had a very high global warming potential. And remember, we placed, replaced it with R134A and R404. And we went, oh, that's, that's not horrible. Actually, we did R407C2 as a, a, a retrofit and a little bit of R422. So we looked at all those and went, hey, all those are pretty good. That's not too shabby. So then we looked at, okay, R22, we went from R22 and all of our systems went pretty much to R410A for residential air conditioning. Went, oh, oh, whoa, what happened? We increased our global warming potential when we went from R22 to R410A pretty significantly. I went, man. Well, we accomplished the ODP. We reduced the ozone depleting potential of our refrigerant, but dang it, we actually increased the global warming potential and went, wow, we just converted most of the world to R410A. What are we gonna do about that? Well, we let it ride for a while, okay? Until we got to a point where we went, we gotta do something about this. We, we have got to get rid of these high global warming potential refrigerants. So that's what we started looking at. And that's what chemists started doing. They started producing these new refrigerants. So we had R134A that went into our vehicles, right? That replaced our um, R12. Well, we came up with R1234YF, this really cool HFO refrigerant. It has a ozone depleting potential of zero and it has reduced its global warming potential of that R134A down to four. So we went from 1,430 times greater than CO2 to four times greater. And so what we did as an industry, we just said, okay, nice, we'll, just, we'll do that. Uh, let's go ahead and do it now. So we did that in 2015. And now we're looking at some of these other ones. If we talk about R290, R290 is a very, very common refrigerant in fractional horsepower refrigeration systems. Like I said, if you go into a checkout lane and you're getting a, a can of pop or bottle of pop out of that two-door cooler, um, they've been using R290 in those, particularly the true manufacturer. They came out with those first that I'm aware of. 
Um, those came out with R290 five, six, maybe even seven years ago because it has a ozone depleting potential of zero and a global warming potential of three. So there is a lot of R290 out there that you're not aware of. If next time you walk by those systems, just take a look at the tag. Next time you open that door, look inside and you'll see a red label, R290 on that thing. So we did that because we got down to three on our global warming potential. You know, we use carbon dioxide, CO2, R744, as a primary refrigerant in a lot of our wholesale grocery stores now. You know, we're starting to see companies like Whole Foods and Aldi's, they are switching their entire systems over to CO2-based refrigeration systems because of this. Zero ozone depleting potential, global warming potential of one. Remember when I said that there was a better refrigerant out there? There is. It's called R717. We know that as ammonia. Ammonia is a really, really, really good refrigerant. It has a ozone depleting potential of zero and it has a global warming potential of zero. What's the downfall of it? Bam. It's a high pressure system that is very flammable and toxic. It's not an A3 flammability, but it is a, it's like an A2L, but it's a B2L. It is slightly flammable, but it is very toxic. It will kill us if it leaks. So we decided not to use that as the base. We decided to use CO2 since it was a safer toxicity to us. That CO2 is a A1. It has very low toxicity, very low flammability. So we're gonna base all refrigerants on it. So every number that you see that is an ODP number or a GWP number, it is being compared against CO2. So if we look at what our replacement refrigerants are going to be going forward, it, it's going to be based on GWP and those numbers are starting to drop. So even though we have set uh, standards for GWP as a world, we also have other jurisdictions like California that is expecting an even lower GWP. So as we look at those numbers, uh, Emerson does a really, if you ever set in on one of um, Don's classes, for um, for replacement refrigerants and look at what those GWPs are, um, it's significant what some jurisdictions are wanting these GWPs to be. So even when we talk about these replacements, you know, we know that companies like Carrier are going to be using R454 in their commercial units um, here in the next couple of years. We know that Daikin is going to be using R32. Remember, R32 is half of R410A. It just doesn't have the, you know, the flame inhibitor in it, the R125. So that R32 is going to have a lower global warming potential, but now it's going to be a flammable refrigerant. We basically took R410A and took the uh, anti-flammability out of it. And so we have a new refrigerant that's popping up. You know, it's got a lower GWP, but it's not low enough. It's not low enough to replace R410A. So right now, here's the hot one. R410A's global warming potential. We have to get that down. And a lot of places want to see that below 500. So we're going to have to come up with a replacement. R404, the most common refrigerant in low temp applications in the United States, is on the chopping block for that reason right there. 3,920. So the world is in a rush to come up with replacements for 404 and 410A. Everyone says, well, when are we going to see that? Um, or are they going to be drop-in replacements? It's probably going to be a very awkward time for the next 10 years for our industry. We're going to have multiple refrigerants. You know, for you young technicians, you probably aren't familiar with what happened when we made this change up here. When we made, I was in commercial refrigeration when we made this change. When we made this change, I had 13 refrigerants in my van. 13. I had 13 recovery cylinders at the shop because we had so many blended refrigerants because if I had an R12 system and it had a pressure control on it, I couldn't put hot shot into it. I'd have to use 409. I, it, there were so many different variations for these. There were interim refrigerants for all of these. Every one of these had some type of an interim refrigerant until we got to here, until the equipment was remanufactured, until it was designed for that refrigerant. So we're going to see systems that will work with one refrigerant and not the other because of its oil. 
or because of its operating pressure or its operating and condensing temperatures. So we're going to see a variety of stuff and we're already starting to see a variety of stuff. Um, the residential R410A, when that happens, um, there's a really good chance that it won't be one refrigerant. There's a very, very good chance it will be different manufacturers using different refrigerants because we're already seeing it in the commercial side. We've already seen Carrier and Dyke can go two different ways. You know, a lot of people don't understand that significance of R410A. Bryant Carrier got the first patent privileges on that. That was just part of that partnership. But the R32, that half of R410A, that was already owned by Daikin. So all they did was they decided, hey, either we're going to have to use Daikin's refrigerant, R32, in our new equipment, or we're going to have to use something else. And they went, yeah, let's go ahead and come up with something else. So they started using this or plan on using this 454. Daikin just went, yeah, we'll just reduce our GWP by taking out that R125 and we'll just use our R32. Most of the world's using it anyhow. You know, a lot of technicians don't understand that. R32 is the primary refrigerant in most of the world for residential AC. R410A is not used in the rest of the world. It's used in the United States primarily. So, you know, we're just dinosaurs. Most of the world has started converting away from R410A already. So now we are in the mix of converting. And there's going to be who knows what refrigerants in there because there's a lot of them that work. If I look at that R1234ZE, that HFO with a zero ODP and a Sick. GWP, it's already being used in places around the world for new chillers, heat pumps, and vending machines. So that is a potential candidate. The downfall of those is having the compressors that work properly for that, having the right compression ratios. So uh, it, we're going to see a lot of changes, and that's the reason it's important to stay brushed up. Even if you already have your EPA license, it's very important to stay up with current technologies because you don't want to be that person that comes into the industry and gets a new piece of equipment and go, R32? I've never heard of R32 before. What is that? Why, why are we using it? Why are we not using R410A? Because that's what's going to happen. So we just want to get you prepared for the changes. We, we want to help you understand that we are replacing refrigerants for two reasons. Ozone depleting potential, which we have pretty well knocked in the butt, and global warming potential, which is what we're working on right now. And so every refrigerant that we are producing is based on that. It has to still maintain that because that was our first initiative. But now we're going to build them based on GWP. So lots and lots and lots and lots of information uh, crammed into an hour and a half. And this is only the first part. So we have three more parts, type one, type two, and type three. And uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and open up our lines. I don't think I'll open up everybody all at once. Um, if anyone has any questions or would like to comment or question on this, go ahead and just put your hand up and we'll do them one at a time. Everybody's brain smoking, it looks like. Too much information for this early in the morning. Looks like there was a question there just in the queue. You kind of answered it, but if you want to address it directly, are these new refrigerants drop in replacements? Probably not. Just remember, technically, there is no drop in replacement. Um, there's always some kind of a consequence. You know, there's always something that is going to be affected. Either it's total refrigerant capacity, total refrigerant charge, um, its ability to mix with the oil properly, uh, compression ratio of the system, uh, seals seals you know there's going to be a lot of complications um so if you want a job in the industry that will have unlimited security it will be commercial refrigeration because every time you change a refrigerant you're not just changing refrigerant you are there for the long haul making ad adaptations to that system i'm just going from r4 or r22 to r407c you know, we had an issue with lubrication where, you know, if I was doing a, a, a large grocery store conversion and I was taking out R22 and I was replacing oil and I was putting R407C in it, um, my complications ended up being that the new polyester oil cleaned the inside of the copper line better than my old mineral or alkyl benzene oil. So now I had contamination getting into my filter dryers and, and into my TXVs. And I also had now... Um, 
Schrader valves that were leaking because of the changes that were affecting the seals on my Schrader valves um, and caps that were on service fittings. So um, no, unfortunately there will not be just direct replacements, drop-ins. There's going to be work, but that's a good thing. That means there's going to be work. Uh, yeah, Steve, that's a really good one. Glad I'm retiring in 10 years or so. You betcha. Um, there's going to be a lot of technicians that will not enjoy the changes coming to our industry, but there will be a lot of opportunity at the same time. So it's a great time to be in our industry. And really, it's always been interesting to be in our industry. It's ever changing. There's new things coming. Um, and we just, we try here at Johnstone Supply to prepare you because as a provider of equipment and tools and, um, you know, accessories, we don't want you coming to us going, hey, when did this happen? We want to be that company that the technician goes, well, where were you when Johnstone was teaching it to us three years ago? So that's why we're here. We're here to help prepare you, help you understand why these changes are happening, and just to make it very common sense that it really has to do with making the refrigerants safer for our environment and for ourselves. All right, anybody else? Paul, Brian, Jesse, anybody have any comments? All right, well, I appreciate everybody's time. We'll get us out of here a little bit earlier than we did yesterday, and we will regroup tomorrow with type one. Everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you too. Thank you.